What's up, what's up? I'm Dr. Omatma, host of Egg Meat Sperm, where we're busting fertility myths, sharing tangible tips for your fertility journey, and bringing you the most knowledgeable guests to support your journey to parenthood. This podcast is for both women and men because getting fertile as fuck is for both partners, don't you think? Remember, just listening to this podcast won't get you pregnant, but following the tips we share just may. Let's get you fertile AF so that you can co-create the family you dream of. And if your partner's not listening to this, make sure to share this episode with your partner. Hello and welcome to Egg Meat Sperm. Our guest today is one of my dear friends, Kate Vasquez, who is a functional medicine physician assistant, founder of Radiant Health, and an award-winning author. She loves empowering high-performance women to reclaim their health and vitality to become the confident leader and lover they aspire to be. She created an online course, The Estrogen Reset, and wrote the bestseller, Estrogen is a Bitch, to bring awareness about estrogen dominance. Kate teaches women how to naturally balance their hormones, use their cycle as their superpower, and reconnect to themselves at their highest level so they can create a life by design that they love living. Hi, Kate. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Hi, Mama. I am just so honored and blessed to be here with you today and having this conversation. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So I am ready to dig in because you've written this amazing book and it has a really snazzy title. (laughs) So let's talk about that. How did you come up with this title and why is estrogen a bitch? (laughs) Yes, yes, I love it. And it's a crazy story because, I mean, I jumped into functional medicine after working in the urgent care for several years, for about six, seven years. And I realized I wasn't really helping people because, I mean, like I'm sure you and I, like we got into medicine to help people. And at the time, I also had my own issues that I was dealing with, but I didn't really think anything of it, didn't think it was a big thing. I just kind of tolerated. I had constipation and anxiety. I had acne when I was a teenager and was taking birth control, which definitely helped, but I had a lot of my own issues and and migraines too, that I had struggled with ever since I was a child. And when I learned about functional medicine, I was amazed at what functional medicine is, is learning about body and figuring out why, why are things happening and how all the systems are integrated and realizing all the things that I was experiencing, there was a correlation, like they were all related. I just had to heal my body. And so I did a lot of the work in healing my body, improving my gut issues, resolving the anxiety, but I was still taking birth control until about almost three years ago when I finally came off the birth control and thinking that, oh, I had already prepared my body, like healing my gut, reducing the anxiety and also supplementing with a lot of nutrients that I was deficient in. And so when I came off birth control, my body went crazy, especially my hormones. (laughs) And when that happened, it actually kind of surprised me because I thought I had already done all the work to prepare, but I hadn't looked at my hormones yet because obviously when you're on birth control, everything's suppressed. And so I ended up doing the testing for my hormones and discovered there was an imbalance of estrogen and progesterone. And so I started to figure out how do I get my hormones into balance? I did a lot of research. And also to mention the symptoms I was experiencing were irregular cycles. I was having breast tenderness and even gained a little bit of weight in my butt, hips, and thighs, and also some severe menstrual cramps, which I never had before going on birth control. I went on it for acne, not for PMS. And then all of a sudden I developed these PMS symptoms. And so when I learned how to balance my hormones, it took a few months, but I was finally able to get regular cycles again, get rid of the breast tenderness, the cramps, and was able to get back to my regular weight. And once that happened to me, I started seeing the same patterns happening in my female clients. And I realized the pattern, what I was uncovering and seeing in myself and my clients was something called estrogen dominance. And then I realized there's not a lot of information out there and women need to know about this. 
So one day I was just thinking about estrogen dominance and all the crazy things that happens to our body when estrogen is imbalanced. And I was like, wow, estrogen is a bitch. (laughs) And when I said that, it actually kind of surprised me because I really don't use this term and I don't use it lightly, which is what I explain in the book. But I realized this was actually true. And I was like, this would actually make a great title for a book. From that moment on, I knew I needed to write about it to help educate women what is estrogen dominance, why is it happening, and what women can do to naturally balance their hormones. Because at the end of the day, if women are experiencing PMS symptoms, it's not normal. Even though we were taught that it's normal, it's really not normal. And there is hope. You don't have to suffer every single month anymore. Um, We have to just look at the hormones and see what's happening, where those imbalances are, and then we can help balance them naturally just to help women really optimize their health and be able to live each month to month, not having to suffer anymore. So, so that was the big reason why I ended up writing this book. Amazing. And I actually love the title. I use a lot of curse words all the time. So I'm like totally comfortable with it. Our show, we had to like put it in the X rated category because I like to use language, but the symptoms that you're describing are probably resonating with a lot of women, right? Hormone imbalances in general, so many of us experience them. And just like you said, PMS is common, but it doesn't have to be the norm. So let's break down a little bit further. What is estrogen dominance? What are the signs and symptoms of estrogen dominance? Yeah, absolutely. That's such a great question because a lot of us when we don't know what estrogen dominance is. And in fact, I was talking to someone and she's like, yeah, I saw a naturopath and she's told me I was estrogen dominant. I thought it was a good thing because she's like a high performing achiever. But then she realized like, no, estrogen dominance does not a good thing, does not mean you're a dominating female. And so what it really means is that there's an imbalance. There's an imbalance in the ratio of progesterone to estrogen. And that's a problem because when there's that imbalance, then the body ends up developing a lot of different symptoms and even disorders. And so a lot of the symptoms that women can experience with estrogen dominance, there's actually a long list, but I realize there are five telltale signs. And especially if you have two or three of these telltale signs, there's definitely an increased chance that you have estrogen dominance. So the first symptom is irregular cycles because So when we go through the menstrual cycle, we have four different phases and our hormones are fluctuating through each different phase. And so when I'm talking about the imbalance of estrogen progesterone, it's actually primarily during the luteal phase when progesterone is reaching its peak, because that's the only time progesterone is really increasing its highest. But so there should be a nice balance between progesterone and estrogen. And when progesterone is not peaking during that time, it actually can throw off our periods because we need progesterone to increase and decline to send signals from our brain to our reproductive organs to let the body know that pregnancy did not occur and so we can have our period. So if that doesn't happen, if women have low, low levels of progesterone, they can actually create an estrogen dominance effect. And actually, I realized there were actually three different types of estrogen dominance. The first pattern is normal levels of progesterone with higher levels of estrogen. The second pattern is low progesterone with normal estrogen. And then the third pattern is low progesterone with high estrogen. So with these irregular periods, I'm seeing a lot of women having lower levels of progesterone. So patterns two and three with either normal or high estrogen. So it's kind of really throwing things off. So we'll typically see a lot of irregular periods with women that have estrogen dominance, plus also a lot of estrogen excess or imbalanced estrogen can also delay ovulation too from happening. So that can create a little bit of irregularity there. The second symptom is heavy periods. And this is because estrogen, when it starts increasing during our late follicular phase, right before ovulation, the purpose is to not only prepare the egg to be released at ovulation, it also helps thicken the endometrial lining, which is that inner lining of our uterus. But when we have a lot of estrogen in our body, a lot of excess estrogen, it can really cause that endometrium to thicken even more. So by the time women actually have their periods, whether they're on time or if they're delayed, now they have a really thick endometrium, they're having really heavy periods. And sometimes they can even have clots with that. Clots the size of quarters, which is not a good sign. If you have clots, definitely get checked out. But 
that is definitely the second sign of estrogen dominance. The third one is PMS symptoms, as I mentioned. And that's because with our hormones fluctuating, if we have lower progesterone levels, we're going to experience more headaches, more mood swings, even insomnia. And then if we have higher levels and balanced estrogen, that's going to contribute to a lot of the menstrual cramps. And that's because right before we start our period, we get released the prostaglandins, which are these chemicals that actually create inflammation in our body, but they're important to help the uterus to contract so we can let go of that endometrial lining and have our period. But when we have excess imbalanced estrogen, it causes more prostaglandins to be released. And that's why we get those really painful, severe menstrual cramps. So that is the third symptom. And then the fourth symptom is the breast tenderness, which is what I was also experiencing as well. And a lot of women can experience that. They tie that into PMS, but I like to separate it because estrogen and progesterone are responsible for the development of our breast tissue when we go through puberty. But the problem is when we get estrogen dominance and we have a lot of excess estrogen in our system, it actually causes that breast tissue to swell and it becomes very painful. So that's why women will experience that breast tenderness right before they start their period. And then the last symptom is weight gain. And now when I talk about weight gain, weight can be distributed in different areas of the body, depending on what's actually going on at a cellular level. Like for example, when women have diabetes or they have adrenal issues like high cord metabolic syndrome, they tend to gain a lot of weight in their abdomen. With estrogen dominance, it's more weight gain in the butt, hips, and thighs. And that's because estrogen is responsible for our curves when we go through puberty. But when we start gaining even more weight, if that's where you're primarily putting on the weight in your butt, hips, and thighs, that's definitely a huge telltale sign of estrogen dominance. So as I mentioned, if you have about two or three of those symptoms, or even all five, definitely is an increased risk of estrogen dominance. Other symptoms can include like fatigue, brain fog, low libido, and even infertility as well. Perfect. So that leads me right into my next question, which is how do we figure out if we do have estrogen dominance? Yes, that is a great question. Well, I recommend testing because that is really the only way because a lot of the symptoms of estrogen dominance can present as other things and other disorders in the body. In fact, estrogen, if it is not balanced, can contribute to a lot of disorders such as like endometriosis and PCOS. But in order to really assess, like, does someone actually have estrogen dominance or not? I recommend getting testing. Now you can get blood work done and to check your progesterone and estrogen levels. So if you get estrogen checked, I recommend getting estradiol and estrone checks because there's actually different types of estrogen in our body. And we can really see these two. And it's important because estradiol is our good estrogen. I actually talk about this in the book. Estradiol is the good estrogen. Estrone is the bad or the rebel estrogen if it's too much in the body. And that the reason being is that we need to check these two because estrogen is getting broken down into specific metabolites. So the blood work is good to kind of get a baseline, but unfortunately it is limited and it doesn't see the metabolites that I love to check which is what I did when I checked my hormones. I did blood work first, but then I did another test, which is a urine test to look at the breakdown of estrogen and that in my body, because estrogen, when it gets metabolized, it gets metabolized in our liver first. It goes through two different phases, phase one, phase two. And then when it goes through liver, it's getting, basically it's going from its active form to it's broken down into an inactive form. And when it turns into the inactive form, it then binds to bile or it goes to our kidneys and is excreted in our urine. But once it binds to bile, then it goes to our intestines. And then phase three is elimination through our gut. So with the urine test, I'm looking at the metabolites when it's being processed through the liver and it goes to the kidneys. So I can see what are the different estrogen metabolites because there's three different metabolites that get broken down. And one of them is actually really good and protective. It actually prevents us from developing estrogen-related cancers. The other two, if they are on the high side, can actually increase our risk. One can increase what's called proliferation of cells, so increase the growth of cancer cells, and the other one can damage DNA. So it's really important that we're assessing not only like how much progesterone and estrogen is in the body during the luteal phase, but looking at these metabolites too, because it's not just looking at is someone estrogen dominant or not, but also like preventative prevention of estrogen-related cancers on a long enough timeline. And so 
I'll sometimes do the blood, but I really, really like the urine tests. And also the benefits of the urine test is looking at cortisol levels too, because cortisol can definitely impact hormonal imbalance. And so I can look at the cortisol throughout the day and make sure that women don't need to support their adrenals as well, which could ultimately impact progesterone levels and create inflammation in the body and increase estrogen. So cool. Thank you. Let's talk a little bit more about that. So how does cortisol affect our hormones? Yes, that is a great question. So cortisol in our sex hormones are all produced from cholesterol. And this is actually why women should not fear fat. And I get it. I used to be scared to eat fat (laughs) when I was younger because unfortunately we were just taught if we eat too much fat, we're going to get fat. But that is not the truth at all. In fact, I realized once I started consuming more healthy fats, it helps the production of my hormones. And I actually stopped having cravings and crashes between meals, which was a game changer because one of the things with migraines is that if you're not eating enough meals in a day and your blood sugar is crashing, it's going to contribute to migraine. So making that switch and consuming more healthy fats made a huge, huge difference. So with that being said, understanding that cortisol and our sex hormones are produced from cholesterol, but when our bodies are under a lot of stress, we're constantly in that fight or flight mode, our bodies are going to be more focus on producing more cholesterol or excuse me, more cortisol than our sex hormones, especially progesterone. And that's because when our bodies are relaxed in that parasympathetic state, we're in that calm, like rest and digest, the body's thinking about more about like, oh, let's reproduce versus if we're in that fight or flight mode, the body is thinking more survival. It's not thinking about reproduction. And this is important to understand because I see this very commonly in a lot of women and I experienced this myself when I was under a lot of stress and on birth control, my progesterone levels were suppressed and I needed to do a lot of work to help increase my progesterone levels. So when the body's producing more cortisol and less progesterone, which progesterone eventually will go on to make testosterone and estrogen, but if we have lower levels of progesterone, it will create an estrogen dominance effect, especially if we have a lot of estrogen in our system, but during that luteal phase, it's not being produced. We're going to have that estrogen dominance effect, seeing those two patterns, you know, pattern two and pattern three with a low progesterone level. So that's how high cortisol is going to contribute to estrogen dominance. And it's also going to increase inflammation in the body. And a lot of times, sometimes women will lose weight, but some women will gain weight when they have high, high cortisol levels. And with that weight gain leads to increased fat cells. And it's something to understand is that our fat cells do produce a little bit of estrogen too. So it's not just our reproductive organs, our fat cells. So when women are gaining weight and increasing fat cells, now they're producing even more estrogen. So that is how high cortisol can definitely contribute to estrogen dominance. Beautiful. So it's really important to have that conversation because I find a lot of times the easy answer that people hear is like, oh, you're too stressed. You need to have less stress. And it's not that easy. So it's helpful to really understand like how cortisol is impacting our hormones and that that impact is kind of severe. It's not immediate, but it will build over time. So if you have moments of stress, it is what it is. But if you have stress all the time and you're constantly stressed out, you're really impacting your hormones in a deep, deep way. Oh yeah, absolutely. And that's something I had to learn because, you know, unfortunately in conventional medicine, you go to the doctor or the provider and you're like, I'm stressed. They just want to put you on a pill. And that's what happened to me during PA schools, the most stressful time of my life. And I call it medical school boot camp because it's just like four years of medical school packed into 27 months. And it was very, very stressful. And I was having migraines every single day. So of course I go to the doctor and they're like, here, take Prozac, which I did. But unfortunately the stress didn't go away and I didn't know how to manage it. I just felt numb, like emotions were numb. And I was like, I don't like this feeling. And I knew I definitely didn't want to keep taking this for the rest of my life because I love feeling my emotions and joy and happiness and all the emotions. But when I was taking that, I just felt numb, but the stress was obviously still there. And it wasn't until 
I finally went into my rotations, I was able to get myself off of the Prozac. But then I started doing more yoga. I started doing yoga, learning about meditation and deep breathing. I taught myself how to adapt to stress. And I like to say adapting to stress because I, I don't like managing stress. Like <laughs> we're always going to yeah, have like stress, who wants but to manage stress? Like, who wants to manage it? Exactly. I don't want to manage I'm, any more things in my life. I exactly. Really don't. <laughs> exactly. I'd rather learn how to adapt because the stress is always going to be there. And there's different types of stressors. You know, we're, we're going to have physical, emotional, chemical. There's always going to be stress in our life. Even if physically, emotionally, we feel good chemically, there's stress going on, especially inside of our bodies. But I think the biggest thing is just learning how to adapt because crazy things will happen in our life that are out of our control. But if we learn how to adapt, we're going to actually be able to show up better and have lower cortisol levels and be able to navigate through things a lot easier. And it's better for our health as well. So you mentioned something a while ago that I want to loop back around to, which is that estrogen dominance can contribute to fertility issues. So let's talk about that because I'm sure everyone listening in wants to know all about that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is the the point of the podcast because I do believe when women are trying to conceive, actually men too. So yes, I'm talking mostly about women and the book is mostly about women with estrogen dominance, but I do have a small section about estrogen dominance and men because it can impact men's fertility as well. But when it comes to women, estrogen basically acts as natural birth control. So if we have excess amount of estrogen in our body, especially if we have lower levels of progesterone, it's going to act like natural birth control. I mean, that's the point of birth control. It's the synthetic estrogen that you're taking every single day to prevent pregnancy. Yes, it's paired with a synthetic progesterone, but it's not the same as the progesterone our body makes because our progesterone that our body makes actually changes the uterus to receive a fertilized egg. But the progesterone that's in birth control is completely different and it changes endometrium, but not to receive the fertilized egg. But when we have estrogen dominant, even if we're not taking birth control, that excess estrogen can act as natural birth control. And as I mentioned, like it can impact ovulation. So it not only can delay, but I do believe it can cause inovulation. So women with PCOS, we think have high levels of testosterone, androgens, it impacts ovulation. Sometimes they're not even having ovulation, but estrogen can do that as well. In fact, a lot of women that have PCOS have high estrogen too. Unfortunately, does not get addressed. So it can definitely contribute to infertility. And then I also mentioned the low progesterone too. So if women have lower progesterone levels, it's creating that estrogen dominance effect because there's low progesterone and ratio to that estrogen in the body. And we need progesterone. We need it for pregnancy. It's our pregnancy hormone to help maintain and sustain pregnancy. So if you're not producing enough progesterone, that's going to be a problem. So that can definitely contribute to infertility as well. Perfect. So I'm going to put you on the spot and ask you, what are ways to increase progesterone? Because I kid you not, I get this question three times a week in my DMs. <laughs> How do I increase my progesterone? Isn't there yes. one magic pill that I can take? Yeah. And you know, could you go to someone to prescribe you progesterone? Absolutely. But I believe if women are still cycling to do everything they can naturally first, because when I came off birth control, my progesterone levels were so low and I was able to do everything to help balance them. So I talked about healthy fats. Like the first thing is food, consuming lots and lots of healthy fats. So fats that are omega-3s, wild-caught salmon, avocado, nuts and seeds, olives. So I started consuming a lot more fats. And then two, adapting to stress. That was the big thing. Because remember, when our bodies are under stress, we are not going to be producing as much progesterone. The body's going to be focused on more on producing cortisol because we're in that survival mode, not reproduction mode. So you definitely want to start learning and figuring out different ways and things that you can do to help your body to adapt to stress because that's going to be key. And then the third thing is not only focusing on foods, but specific nutrients. Unfortunately, there's a lot of women, including myself, I was deficient in B vitamins, like B6 is needed for the production of progesterone, vitamin C is also another big, big nutrient that a lot of women are deficient in as well. In fact, our adrenal glands 
contain the most amount of vitamin C. So going back to like being stressed, if we're constantly stressed, we're depleting vitamin C from our adrenals. And if we don't have vitamin C to support our adrenals and to support progesterone, then we're not going to be able to produce it. So B6 and vitamin C are the two nutrients that I always recommend and support women with to help produce progesterone. Now, the fourth one is herbs. Herbs can also help, but I recommend use it with caution and get testing first, just because if women have PCOS, this one herb that I love and recommend is called Vitex, which can really help support progesterone naturally. But if you have a high LH, luteinizing hormone ratio to FSH, which is follicle stimulating hormone, it can actually worsen PCOS. So if you have PCOS or subclinical, you might not have been diagnosed, but have a lot of symptoms, definitely get your FSH and LH ratios checked first. Because if they're one-to-one, then you're good. You can take Vitex. But if it's a three-to-one or even a two-to-one, I would say, I would use it with caution because I've seen women come to me taking it and they had really high LH levels and I got them off immediately. Thankfully, there are other things that you can do to really help support progesterone. But I always recommend seeing a practitioner first, get testing just to see if this is something you can take. But in the meantime, focus on those healthy fats. Oh, and going back to the foods as well, not only healthy fats, but foods that are high in vitamin C. So all those orange and red foods, red peppers, oranges, carrots, definitely load up on those as well. Great answer. And I love that your solution is not to get a progesterone suppository. (laughs) Yes. If we can like give our body the chance to produce it naturally, we don't need to supplement. And I feel like a lot of practitioners are quick to prescribe it and it's still not treating the root cause and you're suppressing your body's ability to produce it naturally. So do everything that you can to produce it naturally. Granted, yes, there are some people with congenital disorders that actually need it, need progesterone because their body can't produce it. And that's the case. Yet there's always a time and place for it. Or if you've just done everything and it's still not coming up, then absolutely use it as a last resort. Totally agree. Thank you for stating that because people do not believe me when I tell them. (laughs) But believe it because I was able to get my progesterone levels up naturally by just doing all those things. Yes. Okay. So I'm sure that there are some people wondering, estrogen dominance feels a little bit like a pandemic. (laughs) Maybe it's the world that I'm in (laughs) because I feel like I just see so many women with estrogen dominance, right? And I feel in some ways that word is getting so much buzz lately that more people are talking about it and more people are like, oh, yeah, it must be my estrogen dominance. But can we talk a little bit about what it is that's causing estrogen dominance to be so rampant? Oh my goodness. There's so many things that's contributing to it. And yeah, I think it is a pandemic that women are not aware of and that's starting to be brought to light because the world we live in is so different than it was many, many years ago. One of the first things that I look at, because I remember I talked about estrogen metabolism, there's three different phases. So the third phase is really important to look at and address as well, because that's your gut. And you want to make sure that you are having regular bowel movements every single day. When I was struggling with constipation, that was not happening for me. (laughs) And I didn't realize that that was important because also in school, we're taught whatever is normal for someone is normal. And that's just the way it is. And So if someone's going every day or excuse me, every other day or every third day, and that's normal for them, don't worry about it, but no worry about it because we should not be going every other day, every third day, once a week, we should be going every single day because that is how we are getting rid of inactive estrogen and also toxins as well. So looking at gut health, a lot of us, unfortunately have issues with our gut. I definitely had it which is why I had a lot of constipation and bloating that I developed in my 20s. Gut health, we have the microbiome, which is trillions of microorganisms in our gut. In fact, we have specific bacteria. Their role is to help elimination of estrogen. It's called the estrobilum. It's estrogen plus microbiome put together. These bacteria are working in our gut to help our bodies get rid of estrogen. So if we have a disruption of our gut bacteria, when we have like 
an overgrowth of bad bacteria or yeast or parasites, or we don't have enough stomach acid to support digestion of our food. A lot of things can impact our gut health. Oh, we also have the gut lining barrier too that gets impacted from like stress, from medications, from toxins, the food we eat, all these things can impact our gut health. So that is the first thing I look at because that too is a pandemic in itself. A lot of people with gut issues. So we really want to support the health of the gut. So we're supporting healthy elimination of estrogen every single day. And not to mention, there's also an enzyme called beta-glucuronidase, which is also supposed to be very low in the gut. But when we have that disruption of our gut bacteria, it increases. And the problem with this enzyme when it's high is it turns inactive estrogen back to its active form. And so now the body thinks that estrogen is ready to go and be used again, and then it reabsorbs it back into the body. And that's the problem because we don't want, our goal is to use estrogen and get rid of it, not use it and then reuse it and then keep reusing it more and more and more. So we want to make sure that we have good gut health. So that enzyme is low. We have that bacteria that's helping to get rid of that excess estrogen. So that is definitely one of the main contributors to estrogen dominance too. I talked about stress a little bit, but I definitely want to just bring that back in because that is probably stress is another big running pandemic in our country that a lot of us are dealing with and haven't really been taught how to adapt to stress. So learning how to adapt to stress is going to be a game changer as well. The third thing is toxins. So I briefly mentioned it already, but toxins in our environment, it's in our food, it's in our home, it's in the products we use on our body. Toxins are everywhere. And when I learned about the different toxins that we're exposed to on a daily basis, I was shocked. In fact, when I was looking at the environmental working group, they did a study and showed that women use on average 12 products a day and leave the house with 168 chemicals on their body. And when I saw that, I was like, oh my goodness. (laughs) I ran to my bathroom and started like grabbing all the products I was using and counting. I'm like, oh my gosh, am I using like over a hundred chemicals? And it was an eye opener for me. And at the time, I kind of was a little overwhelmed because I'm like, oh my gosh, I got to clean like everything out of my house. Like everything's toxic. But I realized I just need to do the best that I can and just start swapping things out one at a time. Because yes, it is a lot. It's a lot of money. But if you just start with swapping one thing out at a time, eventually over time, you'll clear everything out and have better products in your home. But yeah, it's the personal, it's like the makeup, the shampoos, the body washes, the soaps. But also literally the laundry everything. detergents. Yeah, everything. everything. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> because these toxins, they're xenoestrogens. They are foreign chemicals that are molecularly the same as estrogen. And the problem is that when we are exposed to these chemicals, they're binding to the same receptors as estrogen in the body, the est- those estrogen receptors. And so now the body thinks that there's even more estrogen than there really is. So we got to really reduce our toxic burden. Plus these toxins, even plastics, you know, plastics contain BPA, which can impact egg quality. So it's contributing estrogen dominance, impacting egg quality, and then phthalates, which are found in a lot of our, you know, lotions and body washes and creams and perfumes and stuff like that impacts egg quality as well. So we really want to reduce the toxic burden in our home. Another thing is birth control. You know, I talked about, I was previously taking it and it impacts our gut lining. So I really do it. In fact, there are studies that show that it contributes to leaky gut which is increased permeability. So meaning these tight junctions that we're supposed to have are opening up because things are causing insult to our gut, such as medications like birth control and Advil and leave those anti-inflammatory medications, toxins in our environment, stress, you know, all these things are affecting our gut lining. But yeah, there are studies that show birth control contributes to leaky gut, including the development of ulcerative colitis and Crohn's, which is crazy, but also birth control it decreases the liver's production of bilirubin. And we need bilirubin to produce bile. And we need bile to bind those inactive estrogen to get rid of it. So if birth control is impacting the liver's ability to produce bilirubin, now we're not able to eliminate even the synthetic estrogen that we're taking, which is really, really crazy. So yeah, birth control is another contributor. And another thing that I like to talk about as well is histamines, because this is also something that doesn't get talked about and addressed as much. And I think this is too, is a lot of people are starting to have awareness about what it is, something called histamine intolerance, or even some people have mast cell activation syndrome where they have this increased amount of histamines in their body, but 
they genetically just aren't able to break it down. And so when that happens, histamines and estrogen actually end up attaching the same receptors, which is H1. So people with histamine issue and they have excess imbalanced estrogen will actually develop worsening symptoms of estrogen dominance. Plus histamines can flare up estrogen, estrogen can flare up histamines. So it becomes this vicious cycle. So yeah, so that's another cause, but there's so many things, but the biggest one is the gut health, the stress, the medications, the toxins in our environment and histamines can be another contributor as well. Wow. You just shed so much light on so many different aspects that I think women really will resonate with because I think that a lot of women are struggling with this stuff. And I think there's some really actionable things in our chat today that I think will help support so many. So thank you so much for all of your incredible wisdom. Thank you for being with me today. I know that we will have a link to your book in our show notes, but how can people get in touch with you? Yeah, absolutely. They can find me at yourradianthealth.com. I'm also on Instagram at Kate Vasquez underscore PA. If you have any questions, definitely just send me a message. I love talking to people and just help educating. So if you have any questions about anything, definitely reach me on Instagram. You can also find me on Facebook and LinkedIn, but I'm mostly active on Instagram. So you can definitely find me there. The book will be on Amazon. And also too, I am going to provide you guys with a guide on five ways to balance estrogen. So it's a quick little guide that you could go through to start taking some steps right away to really start balancing those estrogens. Incredible. Awesome. Well, for those of you that are listening in, Kate will be back to share amazing tips that you can take and put into action all week long. So make sure to tune in and we will be seeing you soon. Thank you, Amama. Thank you so much for having me today. Thanks for being here. Was that an amazing episode or what? Make sure to check our show notes so that you can link up with our guests. And if you're not a part of our secret Fertile AF community, you can join for free via the link in our show notes. Last but not least, have you shared us some love lately? It would mean the world to us if you could share and review our podcast. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time on Egg Meat Sperm. Peace.